Thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I have to admit, I, I'm rarely invited to uh, economic institutes and to conferences of economists. My, my parents would be quite uh, proud of me. I'm, I'm the only black sheep in the family who is not economist. So I'm, I'm full with very good economists in the family, but I, I'm the only one who, who did not become uh, an economist. But, but uh, at least, um, yeah, I can participate in, in, in such, such good uh, discussions with economists. But I, I don't want to even pretend that I have a, any expertise on, on economics. So the economy is something that we, I will not talk about. But probably, yeah, uh, a lot of people in the audience can come up with good um, uh, this, this part of the picture as well that I will uh, rather ignore. And I, I do think, of course, it's, it's a perspective of political scientists and, and social psychologists, because I think everyone likes to see the world through the lens of, of his or her own discipline. But, but I do see that uh, the whole uh, Hungarian political development, what we could observe in the last uh, eight years practically, is much more proof of that uh, economy is in itself insufficient to, to explain uh, deep and, and, uh, and important uh, social and political uh, changes. And, and in a lot of cases, identity politics can override uh, uh, economy. And I will tell you a few things about that. Probably it could be a good uh, starting point for a debate as well. So what are the questions that I will address in my uh, presentation briefly? And, and really glad to discuss other things as well in the uh, question and answer session. Uh, in what ways Hungary is a typical and a specific case? Hungary unquestionably receives much bigger attention in the international media in the last uh, uh, eight, 10 years than it, it would deserve based on its, the size of the population, the size of the economy, and, and the uh, political weight in international organizations. So how much does it, is it something that is, is uh, rather is part of the zeitgeist, and how much is it, is it specific? The other question is that what are the characteristics of Viktor Orban's regime? Or to put it more specific, what were the uh, preconditions uh, of the uh, development and the evaluation of, of uh, the liberal tendencies that we are uh, observing these days? Um, how big uh, role the media environment plays in what's happening in, in Hungary? And what, is, what are the characteristics of what I would call the post-truth regime in Hungary that can be characterized with a, more and more a dominance of fake news and conspiracy theories? So uh, an environment where fake news and conspiracy theories are not coming from the fringes, but coming from the mainstream. Um, and yes, what, what were the uh, social psychological preconditions and consequences? So, why laboratory? Why the title of the presentation? I think what goes on in Hungary can be regarded as a laboratory in many sense. First of all, Orban from the very beginning uh, likes to test the domestic uh, public opinion and the international public opinion as well. The, the uh, Hungarian society and uh, the European Union and the international players and, and, um, uh, and uh, institutions about what are the borders, what are the limits of action. And let's say the, the big uh, lesson that we could learn in the last eight years is that the limits are way beyond what we thought before. So what went on in Hungary in the last eight years, a quite um, deliberate and conscious demolition of checks and balances and weakening of democratic institutions, it remained uh, without any drastic consequence from the Hungarian public opinion, something we didn't really think before. It remained without any major consequence from the European Union. Orban is still the member, or Fidesz is still the member of the European People's Party, the most mainstream party within the European Union. And of course, there are infringement procedures, there are debates, there is right now the Article 7 procedure, which we, or everybody knows will not lead to the suspension of the voting rights of Hungary. But generally, 
uh, Orban could build up a hybrid regime uh, in the heart of Europe without facing any uh, serious consequences from the uh, European Union. So he's testing the limits, and he found that the limits is way beyond what we saw. Um, also, uh, he uses models from the West and the East alike. So in this laboratory, he can test uh, different kind of policy solutions, how to treat with the NGOs, how to treat with the uh, independent institutions, how to fight uh, political uh, debates, a lot of what ideology to use for a hybrid regime, and a lot of lot of models and inspirations are coming from the East. He's meeting more and more with uh, uh, politicians from the East, dictators from the East, and of course, it, it uh, he uh, looks at international models carefully and adapting some of the uh, parts of, of of policies. For example, the NGO law that uh, pushes NGOs to reveal their foreign funding. This is practically a copy-paste of a, a, of a quite similar Russian law and so on and so on. But at the same time, this is not, Orban cannot be described as only a pro-Eastern autocrat who uh, is inspired only by the East because he is the last, if, if Chancellor Merkel steps down, he will be the last, the uh, last, the, the, uh, prime minister that is serving for the most time uh, within the European Union, so the most experienced Western po politician. And of course, he uses uh, this experience. He knows how uh, the European Union works. He knows how politics works. Uh, and he adapts quite a lot of, and I think he, he uh, understands quite well in which direction the uh, European politics evolve. Probably he he miscalculates the, the pace of these uh, developments and I think the, the end result of the developments. But in the last few years, for example, especially for, uh, since the beginning of the refugee crisis, he could pretty much see in which direction the European public opinion and European politics uh, goes. And, and he adapted to that, uh, that uh, politics of tomorrow. Um, and also, or it's a laboratory of also because Orban not just wants to uh, change European Hungarian policies and Hungarian public opinion, but he talks increasingly to a European demos. Uh, Pro-governmental think tanks in Hungary are doing regular polls in sometimes 28 member states, uh, sometimes uh, 14 EU member states, but most important EU member states on how much the people are. Uh, are resonating to the messages and, and ideology of Orban. So he talks increasingly to a European demos. And uh, a lot of uh, politicians within the European Union regard him as a model, not just in Central Eastern Europe, where he is the success man. Uh, after, third, uh, after the third consecutive um, uh, constitutional majorities, uh, one in a row, but also more and more in Western Europe. Uh, politicians like um, Christian Strache, or Matteo Salvini openly admire uh, Orban's uh, uh, willingness to transform the European Union and also his ideology. So I think Orban's impact went way beyond the borders of, of, of Hungary. So it's also a laboratory that others are looking at and sometimes if good recipes are found, they take it and, and apply in their own circumstances. So what have been the preconditions of the of, uh, uh, of, of uh, Orban coming into power and what have been the preconditions of, of uh, Orban changing the, uh, the political institutions. I would say that there were mainly three of them. Uh, we discussed it with a joint article with, with uh, Joao Tanyadi that was published in Journal of Democracy. We, uh, what we usually, uh, what we push for is an is a, is a explanation that does not think that Hungary is a very specific case in the sense that there are these uh, historical determinist uh, narratives that, yeah, Hungary is doomed to nationalism because of Trianon trauma, for example, or because of that, that yes, it's deeply entwined into the national culture. I think uh, nationalism is deeply entwined into practically every, uh, uh, every national culture. It's, I think, this is, I think, a weak explanation. What led to this, uh, I think long lasting uh, uh, and increasingly also return governance is, is three factors. First of all, 
the uh, political system. That was one very important element of the political system. If you gain a two-thirds majority in Hungary, which Orban could do having more than half of the votes back to 2010, uh, because of the majoritarian elements of the electoral system, the uh, individual constituencies, it was transformed into a two-thirds majority, a constitutional majority. With a constitutional majority in Hungary, you can do whatever you want. You can introduce a kingdom, you can change any laws you have. O of course, you have the European uh, obligations and legal framework, but apart from that, you can practically modify the whole system. And this is what happened after 2010, with changing the composition of the, of the uh, constitutional court, which was the most important counterbalance to, to the uh, executive and, 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 uh, and legislative uh, power. Uh, you can uh, appoint a very loyal um, leader to the, uh, to the uh, prosecutor's office, which practically uh, serves as a shield from any uh, attacks uh, from uh, from independent institutions or the media when it comes to corruption, there is there are no there is practically no legal consequence of governmental corruption in Hungary because the prosecutor's office uh, arranges it. Uh, so there you have there was this one element of the political system that allowed uh, Fidesz to gain two thirds majority alone. There was another two thirds majority in Hungary between 1994 and 1998 of the socialist liberal government, but it was, first of all, before the EU accession. Second, it was a, a post-communist party in power that had to be pretty reserved because it was under, under let's say, it was just right after the transition, uh, and, and also it was a coalition government. And after 2010, there was, for a lot of years, for five years, consecutive years, there was a constitutional majority that allowed the government to transform the, the, the system. And, and Orban was very conscious from the very beginning to occupy the institutional system. Why? Because in 2002, when he first lost the power, he had the experience that if the institutions are not on your side, you can easily lose the uh, power. This is the lesson, by the way, that, that Kaczynski learned as well. Uh, you need a charismatic leader who can be, uh, who can, uh, let's say, um, who can send a message of this change and, and creating a new era. And what, what Orban promised before going into power is not that he did not go into specifics about how he wants to transform the system, but uh, he promised big changes and he definitely uh, achieved uh, big changes. Uh, and you need the public opinion as well. And let's take a look at the public opinion back to 2009. It was an a public opinion poll of Pew Research, which indicates uh, quite spectacularly that Hungarians were, in 2009, just one year before Orban came into power, were the least, uh, most pessimistic about the current economic situation. 94% of Hungarians told that the uh, economy is in a very bad shape. And of course, in that respect, of course, I will not say that the economy does not matter. Um, in Hungary, uh, austerity measures began in 2006 because of the uh, irresponsible uh, fiscal policies of the social liberal governments in, in the previous uh, years. So it was three years, uh, consecutive years of austerity measures. Hungary, Hungarians thought the most that people are worse off than under communism. More than two thirds of them uh, thought this way and also they were the least satisfied with, with uh, democracy. So there is a general phenomenon in uh, Central Eastern Europe, what I would say, let's say, transition fatigue or democracy fatigue. Uh, but, but Hungary was definitely the cheerleader of, of uh, this uh, sentiment. Um, wh what do we see right now after eight years of, of, of governance? So Fidesz uh, won the elections in 2000. 10, in 2014, and in 2018 as well, uh, with a two-thirds majority, with uh, last time practically with half of the votes. Right now, their popularity is still around on the same level as it was at the election. I'm just showing that because, because of all these uh, demonstrations about the uh, overtime law and so on, could send the uh, illusion that uh, the Hungarian government's popularity have declined a lot. It declined a bit 
but really not drastically. And this is the opposition, a very divided opposition of a far right uh, party and a lot of left wing liberal parties that, uh, that right now seem to come together a bit more and, and cooperating a bit more efficiently, which can have an impact, especially on the upcoming municipal elections, probably in the European Parliament elections as well, but the gap is, is uh, really huge. So and this is, I think, even something that changes our thinking on how populist parties can uh, do when they are on power. What are the typical, let's say, a political, um, what was the traditional approach among uh, political scientists? Maybe economists were more clever uh, than that, but uh, the traditional understanding was that yes, populists come into power and they disappear quickly because they had big promises, they can achieve nothing, reality comes in, and, and they simply cannot uh, deliver. And what we can tell after eight, eight years of, of, um, of governance is that, yes, uh, pop, uh, what uh, Joao de calls the populist establishment. Populist establishments can deliver, and they can even create institutions. So populism is not just about destroying institutions. It, if apply, applied wisely, it can create institutions as, as well and, uh, and, and do it quite uh, successfully. Um, what, uh, yes, in, in what respect we can talk about Hungary as, as an exception and what uh, respect we can talk it about uh, as a rule. So I would say that in many sense, what we can observe in, in, in Hungary fits into some kind of zeitgeist. First of all, the populist zeitgeist that we can see all around the world practically, and everybody knows the, the examples, so I don't have to quote them uh, here, but it's not just in the European Union, but in, in uh, United States as well, in Brazil, and a lot of other countries, we see that these leaders who are, let's say, uh, gaining can gain political capital with uh, questioning uh, the, the uh, rationale behind the uh, representative democracies and attacking uh, global institutions and so on and so on. Uh, so, Orban was an early bird of this zeitgeist, but, uh, but uh, he fits into that uh, definitely. Uh, there is an illiberal wave in Central Eastern Europe as well, and this is what I, so democracy is not in a very good shape in, in uh, Slovakia, neither. I mean, in these days, Robert Fico, ex-prime minister, wanted to occupy the leadership of the constitutional court, and why, as he couldn't, Therefore, he blocks the whole process of nominating uh, constitutional judges. The, uh, the, the uh, developments in Poland are really well known. In the Czech Republic, there are some strange developments as well. So we can say that, and it's not just because of Orban says the model, but because there is this democracy and the transition fatigue, and, and, uh, and in, in these young democracies, there is uh, that are a li bit more vulnerable to these attempts, there is this uh, uh, shift uh, towards a bit more authoritarian understanding, even if it's really uneven. And I, I would say that, that in Hungary it went way beyond uh, than in the other uh, countries, even in Poland. And even also there is another general phenomenon in, in Central Eastern Europe, which I would call the platonic xenophobia, which is anti-migration sentiments without the migrants. So uh, if you check the, uh, the uh, Eurobarometer polls, you can see the two countries that are the most concerned about migrants uh, are Czech Republic and Hungary. Uh, not Austria, not Germany, not France. The countries that have really significant immigrant communities, uh, but in two countries where the Muslim immigrant communities are really negligible in size. You have Islamophobia, but you don't have uh, Islam uh, and, and Muslims there. So this is a general sentiment in whole Central Eastern Europe, even if it's a bit more, uh, bit more visible in, in Hungary. But uh, we can see that politicians who, are, who stood up against the quotas and, and were strong critics of any, let's say, soft uh, approaches in the migration crisis, they could gain popularity in the, since 2015. The politicians that were more reserved in that respect, uh, they, uh, they, they told more about the 
uh, the need for tolerance and 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 to welcome the people in need and so on and so on. They, their popularity have been rather dropped. So it, in that respect, Orban is also typical. Uh, what are the two features in which I would say Hungary is rather exceptional? Hungary is, as as two very good uh, Hungarian political scientists wrote down, the only externally constrained hybrid regime. Externally constrained by the European Union, some can say that maybe these constraints are not that strong if we uh, take a look at the outcome, but still, uh, there are no other hybrid regimes within the European Union. And uh, there are uh, other, uh, let's say, institutions who are saying the same. Freedom House has just came up with the new democracy ranking, and Hungary uh, is the first EU member so far uh, that received, uh, that, that was put in the category of the partly free countries, not in the free countries. So, which means practically a hybrid regime. And and uh, and and this is this is something new. The, the other thing is that uh, I would say Hungary is the only regime of postures within the within the European Union, where, as I said, uh, because of a very centralized media conglomerate that, let's say, Silvio Berlusconi could have never dreamed of, uh, in size of, of course, the Hungarian uh, population. But uh, there, the conspiracy theories and fake news that practically became an official ideology and more and more part of the mainstream communication. And it has quite deep impact on the public opinion. OK, I would jump over a few sides. I, I would just like to say that in our understanding, um, what goes on in Hungary is less, let's say, this uh, uh, a populist development, it's more a tribalist development. And we definitely we generally think that tribalism is a better word to explain populism. Because in Hungary, for example, if we ask people, Fidesz voters, that uh, what's their opinion on the elite, of course, it's pretty good because uh, their uh, party is on uh, uh, power. If you, uh, they don't have anti-establishment sentiment and they are more authoritarian than people-centric. Uh, so the traditional understanding of populism simply does not fit to the, uh, uh, to the characterization of Fidesz voters or law and justice voters. But if we're looking for explanations on how uh, a party that uses very strong populist rhetoric can remain on power for a long time and still playing this, let's say, this, this uh, uh, universal fight or fighting this universal fight with the elites, the, the, the way is that the elite is transformed on an international level. If you take a look at the uh, supporters of Fidesz in Hungary, they really trust the national parliament. But at the same time, they don't trust at all the European parliament. Supporters of opposition parties are just the other way around. They trust much more the European parliament than the uh, national parliament. And we can see the same picture in Poland as well. So, Wise populists can uh, fight this this uh, this big eternal war uh, with with fighting the Eurocrats and Brussels and the international institutions, and which means that they as uh, and and it's an interesting thing that uh, Orban is having an unprecedented power uh, since the transition a very, in a very centralized government, uh, a very strong executive power. Still, he plays the role of the underdog constantly, and and he he does it. Uh, quite successfully. OK, I'm jumping it over. Um, OK, what, are, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is with the media environment and, and this what I would call this post-truth regime that is uh, being created in, in Hungary. Uh, what are the preconditions for that? First of all, an increasing tribalist sentiment. Tribalism in the sense that, uh, which is not a uh, near Hungarian phenomenon that an emerging uh, public sentiment and it's not just on the governmental side that the uh, political fight is the question of life and death and uh, and democratic institutions are not that important uh, anymore the most important thing is to defeat the other tribe. What we found in Hungary in a lot of uh, polls is that uh, democratic norms are applied in a very selective manner I mean, these are important when it comes to, comes to the other side, but when it comes to us, it's not important. Corruption shows a 
similar picture. Corruption is bad when you are doing it, but when we are doing it, it's it's all fine. Why? Because there is a fight, there is a war, and 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 for a tribal war, tribal political war, you need more political and economic reserves, and that that uh, that undermines the real uh, uh, rationale of. Of, of democratic institutions. You need this sentiment, which is fueled from above, but there is this uh, tradition of tribalism in Hungary as well. Uh, also, you need a charismatic leader. Uh, Orban is un unquestionably what a very talented uh, uh, politician who can keep his supporter base quite happy, and he can make U-turns politically. For example, how to deal with Russia. Uh, back to 2009 only, only 10 years ago, he was one of the most vocal critics of Vladimir Putin's Russia. He, right now, he's praising Vladimir Putin's Russia quite loudly. And what happened with the, uh, with the Fidesz camp? Most of the followers of, of Viktor Orban have made this U-turn as well. So he, he's very good in changing the uh, mindset of his uh, own uh, voters. Uh, and of course, it, the vote composition of Fidesz electoral base is changing as well, but with a quite significant core voter base. An unprecedented media centralization. What happened in Hungary? It's a recent development. What we could see the uh, we could see it coming in the last years as well is that uh, the uh, lot of the private media were built up by pro-governmental oligarchs, uh, and they were turned to governmental mouthpieces. So the public media for a longer time serves as, I would say, a rather low quality propaganda channel for the, uh, for the government. But at the same time, in some cases, this, this uh, let's say, officially public media, uh, sorry, private media in private hands uh, became even more uh, vocal supporter of the government. And right now what happened is that this oligarch-owned media was practically all put in a big foundation. And this big foundation, in a very centralized operational manner, are pushing very similar messages. Uh, and, um, and what is an interesting thing is that these media that were brought up by, as I said, pro-government oligarchs were granted, were given by the oligarchs to this uh, foundation for free, which pretty much revealed that it was not their own money, because I think in, in a let's say, normal uh, uh, free market context, it's hard to imagine that, that businessmen are just giving all their assets to the state without any, uh, without, without complaining. Uh, okay, and, and also, what is uh, an important precondition is using governmental funds for political messaging. For example, in the last uh, mainly six years, there were quite a lot of strong political campaigns in Hungary uh, against Chorsos, against Brussels, and so on. They are all financed by governmental funds. So these were uh, so governmental advertisements. It was not Fidesz's messaging. It was directly public funds uh, coming from the uh, government. Hungarian government spent more money, for example, on anti-Brussels billboards than the whole Leave campaign uh, during the uh, EU uh, uh, referendum. Uh, in, in UK, which is quite talkative. And Hungary is a country of 10 million people. Uh, let me give you just a few impressions about uh, the, uh, how much it goes through the, the uh, public and private media. This is Origo, the still the most popular website in Hungary, uh, which was independent, uh, but then it was taken over in the, in the, uh, in the last years by uh, by people very close to the government, and they were, uh, it was turned a pro-governmental mouthpiece. You can see the uh, migrants, so the migrants everywhere, practically. It's, it's all over. So migrants are, are raping, killing, uh, uh, exploiting themselves, and so on and so on. So they are all doing mass in, in Europe, in Hungary, and elsewhere. So this is, uh, in, the, in the campaign, in the Hungarian campaign, the most important uh, message was that Europe, I mean, Western Europe is a very dangerous place because of the migrants that are arriving there and the immigrants and, and the refugees and so on and so on. They were all, all called, uh, called migrants. It, it was done before the 2018 uh, April elections. 
some of you could probably see this video where uh, the practical de facto deputy prime minister, Mr. Uh, Janos Lazar, minister responsible for the prime minister's office, who is generally rather regarded as a more centrist politician of his own party, but he, he uh, came to Vienna and in, in a quite decent street of Vienna, he uh, made a, an apocalyptic video in which he told that he just looked around here and it's migrants everywhere, there are no Christians, no white people, nobody talks German, and this is what happens if we allow migrants to come to Hungary. So they will transform Budapest the same way then they transformed Vienna. And one message in the Hungarian uh, campaign was that don't turn Budapest into London, into Austria, into Paris, and so on. And, and I mean, a lot of people could feel, I think, that yes, please do. Please, please uh, switch to Vienna. For example, Vienna for Hungarians was always the symbol of the, of the very developed rich West. And if we take a look at public opinion polls, we can still see that the West, uh, Western countries has much better image than Eastern countries. Still, in, 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 uh, after a campaign like this, that West paints the West as a horrible place, Viktor Orban could gain 50% of the votes. So half of the votes of the population, which is, which is uh, pretty much, and, that, and, and I think uh, we can see in that respect that how much role this very centralized media environment can play their similar messages uh, coming from everywhere. We can see a lot of, of uh, this is also a public, uh, med uh, private media, sorry, pro-governmental media that, that uh, says that uh, it was George Soros who, uh, who led the Maidan revolution. The Maidan revolution is something that is mentioned as, as in a pro-governmental media mainly as a as a horrible thing that led to a democratically elected leader uh, to get ousted by, by some evil conspirators. Uh, they are not really like to tell about that Viktor Yanukovych had invited the Russian troops to his country to, to break down the uh, revolution. But anyways, the, the, this is the general narrative that, that George Soros is the troublemaker of Europe and he wants to oust other leaders, for example, Viktor Orban, uh, as well. Um, so conspiracy theories and this, this uh, um, anti-migrant propaganda is pretty dominant. This was a, a billboard campaign in 2015 that said if you come to Hungary, you cannot take the uh, jobs of Hungarians, you have to respect our, uh, our culture and you have to respect our, uh, our laws as well. This is one, also it was a billboard campaign, Stop Brussels. Stop Brussels then doesn't let uh, to bring refugees to Hungary and ch to change the demographic and cultural composition of, of Hungary. Uh, this is an, an anti-George Soros campaign that was even put in the floor at, uh, by some advertisement companies in a very elegant manner. Uh, and apart from this, predominance of, of uh, this conspiratorial narratives that George Soros, with Bra using Brussels as a tool, wants to uh, change the demographic composition of, of Europe and to, to oust democratically elected leaders. Also, there was this uh, increasing tendency in the Hungarian public discourse to refer to this, uh, let's say, heroic attempt to defend our motherland. And, uh, and this is, I think, just an illustration of that. Uh, it's not something very important, but at the same time, I think very talkative, that you can be a border hunter as well. And this, this is, let's say, a, um, a volunteer branch of the Hungarian police where whoever, where anyone can apply to guard the borders from the refugees. And when I brought my, my children to a, to a, a children's concert in one of the Budapest municipalities, uh, it was organized by the local municipality, and, and we could see this recruitment tents there uh, that that you can you can you can apply for a border hunter. So it's practically even nationalizing this this uh, uh, vigilante groups and these militias into uh, into um, 
refer to this to this heroic attempt to defend our motherland and of course in Hungary's history uh, this kind of let's defend Europe from the uh, Muslim hordes and let's de uh, defend Hungary's sovereignty is something that uh, message resonates quite well but it was also exploited quite successfully by uh, by domestic political messaging uh, th this was a, a billboard in the in the uh, in the campaign again, there uh, formerly pro-Orban pro oligarch uh, who turned against Orban is playing with one of the opposition leaders and George Soros is playing with another one. So it's conspiracies uh, everywhere. And, and uh, the, these uh, plots in the background are, are becoming the most important dimension of, of uh, politics. Um, and what in what respect we can, okay, I mean, of course, we can say that there are campaigns everywhere. And sometimes there is this increasingly, uh, how to say, skeptical uh, skeptical line in, in media studies and political science that says that the impact of campaigns are usually quite limited in shaping public opinion. And there are some countries with more decentralized, uh, more uh, colorful and diverse media landscapes where it, it might be true because a lot of contradicting messaging just leads to no big change. But in Hungary, we can see in at least five dimensions that how, that uh, these kind of campaigns had a big impact. Xenophobic attitudes, for example. When the uh, first refugees from Syria appeared in Hungary, appeared to Hungary, there was at least one third of the Hungarian population who felt that they are people in need. And the, and the Hungarian state should help them uh, in, in a lot of manners. Then, after they were just painted as, as aggressive and, and uh, parasitic uh, groups, it's like the public opinion changed quite uh, significant. Then, from an already quite xenophobic public opinion, it became uh, a, a very dominantly xenophobic public opinion in which there are practically no real strong uh, counter opinion. Uh, public opinion on the European Union. Even if the European Union is still quite popular, there are there has been an important change and the popularity rather declined. Uh, Russia versus Washington. Uh, it's a new development uh, from a poll last year by Median that Fidesz voters were asked that who would you choose, Russia or Moscow or Washington as, as an important strategic ally. And majority of the Fidesz voters chose, Wash chose Moscow over Washington, which is rather a new development again, because this anti-Russian, anti-Soviet, and then anti-Russian sentiments were quite important in Fidesz's voter base, but it was changed as well. It's also an impact on, the, on, the, uh, on this uh, political rhetoric. George Soros. George Soros at the very beginning when the campaign began in 2017 was a neutral figure, an unknown figure, and not an unpopular figure. Uh, then, uh, after two years, he became as practically a real bogeyman, uh, a diabolic figure who everybody knows and everybody is afraid of. And George Soros is not in, in the streets of Budapest, so you don't see him. And even the organizations they refer to as, as George Soros' organization, you don't have any kind of everyday contact with them. It's, it's building up an invisible enemy, uh, a Rorschach test, and you can project every, every evil on them. Uh, and, and it worked pretty well, uh, as we know today, with the help of, uh, of Republican, uh, uh, let's say, re radical Republican uh, spin doctors. Uh, and conspiracy theories. Uh, Hungarian population had become very receptive to uh, conspiracy theories. To say a few words, Mus for example, Muslim leaders have a secret plan for conquering Europe and turn it into an Arabic continent. This, is, this comes to one of our polls. 45% of the Hungarian population agrees that Muslims want to uh, force their culture on us secretly. Almost half of the Hungarian population believes in that. Uh, George Soros wants to bring refugees to Europe. In, in Hungary, it was like, wants to refugees to Europe, following a secret plan. 51% of the Hungarians believe into that, and so on and so on. So it's uh, this kind of uh, 
uh, rhetoric that puts uh, uh, Hungarian sovereignty uh, in the contrast of this big international conspiracy, it, it became very, very uh, successful and it's becoming a, an important point of, of uh, the characteristics of the Hungarian public opinion. Uh, and as a last point, uh, we can even see that in some respect, what went on in Hungary, which is not, uh, not an entirely, uh, let's say, following only an Eastern model. So, Yes, there are some uh, some uh, impact and and uh, and, uh, and and things that are coming from the east, but at the same time uh, there are some coming from the west as well. Uh, structure and political ideology. This is something that rather comes from the east. As I said, this big civilizational clash that is emphasized by the neo-Eurasian thinkers like Alexander Dugin and others. Uh, and which is rather dominant in the in the uh, Russian um, official political communication or semi-official political communication. This is something that that uh, is becoming increasingly uh, dominant in Hungary. Uh, this decline of the West narrative and and the uh, and the counter narrative that the future is rather on the on the East. Uh, Yes, specific theories and narratives. This Maidan theory, for example, right now we have the, yeah, uh, practically the fifth uh, anniversary of the Euromaidan uh, revolution. At the same time in Hungary, the Maidan is only depicted in a manner that is a CIA plot, it's a George Soros plot, and evil Ukrainians chased away their democratic elect elected leaders. So this is something that comes directly from the Kremlin communication playbooks. And sources as well. Increasingly in the Hungarian pro-governmental press, Russia Today, Sputnik, Ria Novosti, and others are becoming uh, important sources of inf information, sometimes only sources of information, because of course it's not a problem. If they, uh, they can be important in a many manner, but, but if they are becoming the only sources of information when it comes to what is happening in Ukraine, it's a bit uh, problematic. At the same time, the flip side of that, uh, this Hungarian post-truth regime has quite a lot of Western uh, influence. It was created with the strong help of Western spin doctors, as I said, but also it's not just the uh, uh, Finkelstein and Birnbaum, two uh, political consultants who helped Orban for a long time, but also the uh, Hungarian uh, main spin doctor, uh, Arpad Habon, have uh, met with Steve Bannon as well several times. Uh, asking for advice on a uh, lot of things. And there are this, there is this new alt-right uh, media which is created in Hungary, which is under strong inspiration, I think, of, of, uh, of Breitbart and others. Also, there is this campaign on, uh, there is this, this uh, campaign against the fake news media. So fake news is used against the uh, independent and opposition media as a label that you can just put on them and then you don't have to go to any kind of debates era about the content of the article that they, for example, if they reveal a corruption scandal, you don't say that, oh, yes, it seems like a misconduct, but it was not, and you explain it, but you just say fake news and that's all. And this is pretty much something that comes from the uh, Anglo-Saxon world as well, and the techniques as well is coming, also something that is coming from the West. So I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's really a laboratory in the sense that it, it combines Western and Eastern approaches. In the, on the one hand, it seems like uh, using the most modern techniques in social media and elsewhere. Uh, at the same time, it, it uh, builds on the experiences of the past as well, the 20th century, uh, one byte propaganda messages, that the same uh, message coming out uh, from everywhere. And, um, and uh, and it is increasingly uh, successful. You can you can uh, see it on the polls. And the irony is, yeah, the irony is uh, that in the last few years, Fidesz could remain highly popular uh, without almost saying any words on the economy, while economy was uh, was very successful. And of course, you can claim that this was the real reason of success: more than four percent economic growth. Uh, more than 10% real wage rise for two, three consecutive years. Uh, 
with a very successful, uh, with the very low unemployment level. The big problem in Hungary is not, not the unemployment, but the lack of workforce, and so on and so on. So generally, the economic sentiment was, was pretty good. Still, the government was almost only talking about the symbolic issues, this big fight against Brussels, against George Soros, and so on and so on. And, uh, and, and still, it seems to be uh, something that is, is very successful. Right now, some issues, like as this overtime law, seems to bit reduce the popularity of Fidesz, but it, it still remains intact. And I do think that Orban, what Orban wants to do with the Hungarian society is to turn it into a post-materialist mode, where even if there will be an economic decline, and the government is preparing for an economic decline, they are talking a lot about that, uh, he hopes that because of this, this orgy of, of symbolic politics, uh, he can keep his uh, voter base happy, and, and uh, with, with defending Hungary, he can uh, maintain his popularity. So, sorry for a bit exceeding the, the original time limit that I received. So thanks for the attention and, and any questions are welcome.